old guy, let me turn to some of the theoretical questions here. And uh, I think this wonderful discussion we had uh, reminded me of two, in a sense, primordial sins of the left. Uh, the one is what I call left pessimism, and the second is the narcissism of small differences. Uh, left pessimism, you know, the idea that somehow we cannot intervene, particularly in the direct way that the Bosnian friend was saying, because somehow people have been made to feel stupid. And in a sense that changed. I'll come to that in a minute, but let me say first something about the narcissism of small differences. And my friend here mentioned Laclau. Now, I'm a friend of both Laclau and Zizek, and I've been trying for the last five years to get them together, where I would be like Tony, I have the power, and make sure that you know, they end up agreeing. Because, and this is in a sense the third and the more, imp more important point I want to make, political intervention, particularly political intervention of, from the left, has always to take account of what Aristotle called the kairos, the opportune moment. The opportune moment differs, you know, in Belgium and in Bosnia and in Greece, and it is precisely that sense of timely, timeliness, the, the correct position at the point at which certain conflict and certain tensions become really acute, which is precisely the case in Greece. And once you get to that opportune moment, the idea that either Laclau or Zizek or Marx, God, uh, uh, God save us, has to be followed in all their particulars is absolutely wrong. Because you have in that opportune moment at which the social conflict, the social tension creates the possibilities, the preconditions for the intervention of the left, you have, of course, to choose a number of strategies and types of intervention. So very broadly today we could say, and that is not just for Greece, although again in Greece it became quite obvious, you have within every European social formation a number of people who are totally excluded. Clearly the migrants, particularly the saint Papier, these are non-humans. They have absolutely no recognition within society. Then you have a large and increasing group of people that we could call the disenfranchised, the invisible, as I put it earlier. And of course this is now becoming a huge number of people. The precarité, what the the, 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 the French call precarité. We know that for the next 20 or 30 years, whole groups of the population, particularly the young people, are not going to get jobs. I mean, people beg to be exploited, to get a job because there's no jobs around. And these are people, as the Belgian colleagues were saying, who have the skills. This is the first time in human history that the people who in Europe about 60% have been to post-secondary education have the skills and the abilities and the aptitudes that the leading groups and the elites have. We have exactly the same. And as we now learned over the last two or three years, a thousand unemployed lawyers and engineers and architects can become more revolutionary than a thousand unemployed workers. And this is the point at which you have now to intervene at that level, at the level even of the multitude, to use a term that I'm sure many of you would not like, that is now accepting that the promises they were given, that the life plans on which they worked and went and studied all the way to, you know, sort of PhDs and so on, are not going to work. There, clearly, you have to develop hegemonic type of policies a la la cloud. But when you move towards those who are clearly excluded, those who are totally invisible, then, of course, conflictual politics have to be there. And it seems to me that always the combination of the conflict, the hegemonic, and indeed the party intervention has to be combined. You cannot abandon it, one of these strategies just for the other. And of course, as I said, the opportune moment, the timeliness will decide. But the final point about, uh, about direct democracy in the way that I present mainly through the experience of the squares. And here is the only point in which I disagree with my friend here, because over the last few years I keep, invi I keep being invited to conferences on complexity. Complexity is now big time in, uh, in social theory. Indeed, Cuba. Cuba, every January, has a big conference on complexity. And they invited me to go there. And of course, this idea of complexity is precisely against any idea of participation and understanding. In Syntagma, and I'm sure those of you who've been elsewhere and have been to many of these occupations, not just in Greece, 
the crowd, the multitude showed that they are much wiser than any bloody intellectual or politician or economist. They could discuss all kinds of issues, they could understand what was at stake, and they did not expect the economists, which as we know anyway, are split between the neoliberals, the Keynesians, the left Keynesians and the Marxists, and therefore each one of them has a different view of the world, the multitude could understand and indeed decide on issues. It is precisely that kind of idea that we the people, you know, things are so bloody complex, you know, you cannot understand them, you need the experts, you need the technocrats to tell us, you need those, you know, once you have government to create policy and so on. At the level of political confrontation, political action, you just need people to come together to listen to what they're saying and create will formation. And I said a word that I hate because it comes from Habermas, but let me accept it now. So you, they create will formation. So the very final point, how do you move there? The difference between us, age and epoch and society from what was happening in 68 or some of the earlier, the, the, the anti-colonial movement and so on is this. In biopolitical neoliberal capitalism, what the system, let's call it now, capitalism creates is subjectivities. What it really controls is conduct, comportment, behavior. Ideas, in a sense, are free. You can't be, and as we know, of course, fascists are everywhere. You know, fascistic ideas are free. We heard that in Hungary, in Greece, in Croatia, and so on. But once you are fully in agreement or you accept a way of behaving and acting, basically, unless you become a terrorist, you are accepted. So that is the importance of the squares, which for me are very different than the Occupy movement from, say, the 1960s, and the civil rights movement or the anti-Vietnam war. Because disobedience today means for ordinary people that they find this split in themselves between what elites and the law and the power systems tell and a certain sense of ethics which however in order to operate must first disengage you, disarticulate you from that kind of comportment and behavior. And that is why for me I think these occupations and squares and indignados are a propedeutics, are a preparation for a later revolutionary struggle. Because once you have been disengaged from that idea of consumption, of debt, of acting correctly, whatever you believe, then the next steps are, are, are possible. And to that extent, Europe now is different, and Europe is now going into a really conflictual situation. So while I have absolutely no advice or solution to give to my Belgian friends or the Bosnian friends or the Croatian or anyone else, I would say, let us prepare. We are getting into a conflictual situation and taking account of the specificities of each country with its own history, with its own social formation and its own struggles to see how we can move towards that idea of desubjectification and resubjectification. Taking people from that anonymity of I'm doing okay, who cares, and so on, and putting them in front of the questions and the problems and the conflicts that now are facing all of us, although in different forms in each day. I'm really optimistic. That's why I mentioned uh, pessimism, left pessimism at the beginning. Remember, only three or four years ago, could we have that kind of discussion we have now? Why did we get here? Not because the left parties, including Syriza, which I supported all my life in the different transubstantiations, in a sense, became so important. It is because people went out in the squares without, as uh, the, 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 the Syriza person was saying earlier, my friend uh, Harris, not because the party told them. Now, that is a great victory. It's a great, in a sense, weakening and undermining that kind of subjectification and I think here we have, my friends, we of the left, the responsibility, but also the great honor, of saving the idea of Europe. Because the idea of Europe has been abandoned to the neoliberals in Frankfurt and Berlin and Brussels, and we of the left, in a sense, are now fighting for some of the great achievements of, uh, of, of the European tradition and so on, as, of course, a preparation for a more socialist and a different kind of society. So we have great responsibilities. There is no common blueprint. There is no common plan or strategy that we should all adopt, but we have precisely to look into our specific situations and choose the struggles that can then become generalized.
Thank you. Thank you, Gustav.